in this final message, I wanna share the three most important things in your life. They're pretty significant. These are the keys, not just a key. That isn't big enough. It is <laughs> the biggest keys to knowing God's will for your life, getting out of a rut, breaking a plateau, and living the blessed life God wants you to live. That's a pretty big promise, right? So <laughs> put this down. Gosh, I, when this showed up, it was bigger than I thought. Okay, you've heard a lot today. I taught you the five things you must get over to get ready for your dream. Does anybody remember any of them? Type them in the comments if you can remember. Overlooking, oversleeping, overspending, overthinking, and overriding God's vision for your life. You've learned about finances, relationships, organization, um, your gifts, how to set goals. It's a lot to take in. So I just want to put a bow on this conference. <laughs> First, because I love bows, but also because... This is how you leave the conference saying, I've taken the first proactive step to changing my life. So this is where you start. I'm just gonna toss the boat right there. Okay, years ago, when I was CEO for my dad, he shared a message about how to receive your greatest breakthroughs and it always required three steps. Now I heard him preach these three steps all over the world. I watched him apply it, the ministry applied it, people all over the world applied it. And these three keys were a turning point in our ministry at that time. We received more testimonies that year than ever before. Our ministry broke records. Where we had struggled in the past, the struggle was over. So I applied it at the most challenging time in my life, in a rut, desperate for a breakthrough, and my life has never been the same. Well, now it comes like first nature to me. I do it consistently, and every year, my life has grown and grown to new levels every year. And it comes straight from God's word. So I'm gonna share that with you today. So my dad told the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 17, how he visited a little widow woman who was preparing her last bit of food. In fact, one translation says that she was preparing her last cake for her and her son to eat, which I would want that to be my last meal too, but that's not my point. It was the last bit, and then they were expected to die. They had nothing left, that was it. They'd reached the ultimate plateau, so to speak, and did not know what else to do. All of a sudden, the prophet Elijah shows up at her front door and says that God sent him to give her a message that would change her life and her destiny forever. What was the message? Give me the cake. So if I show up at your house asking for cake, just know God sent me, okay. But seriously, think about the reality of this story. This is all she has left, and the prophet sent God with a message from heaven saying, give it to me. Now, wouldn't you just be like, come again? <laughs> this cannot be God. He knows how bad my life is. The last thing he would want me to do is give you all I have left. But the prophet said God sent him to tell her that. And you know what she did? She said, you have got to be kidding me. She slammed the door in his face because it doesn't make sense. It was insane. She ate the cake and they died. And it's such a sad story in the Bible. No, <laughs> that's not what happened. She got the instructions from God. She obeyed the instructions and she gave God her best. And what happened? God sustained her life. She not only had enough for her and her family, but she had more than enough to enjoy her life and fulfill her purpose. Well, from that story, my dad pointed out that the turning point in your life, no matter what you're facing today, a challenge in your physical body, your marriage, relationship with your kids, your job, your finances, whatever you're facing today, your breakthrough requires these three things. Number one, a specific word from God. She got a word from God. You know, the prophet told her what to do. Now, let me tell you that God not only wants to speak to you about your unique situation, but he literally cares about every detail of your life. You know, Psalm 27, 23, or 37, 23, it says the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. So there's the proof. Well, I can't stress enough the importance of practicing hearing God's voice. He wants you to hear his voice, but it takes practice. You know, I know my husband's voice because I've heard it for 30 years. Even when he tries to prank call me and sound like a little old lady, I'm like, Rodney, what do you want? <laughs> well, 
will, the more time you spend with God, the more you'll recognize his voice. You know, you may have heard me share on a podcast recently how when I was a little girl, different ministers would come to our church and at random times they would have all the children come up to the front and they would pray over us. And sometimes they had a special word for each of us. And I remember one minister praying over my sister and he said, you are a lion. You're a powerhouse. You're bold. You're a lion in the body of Christ. And I stood right next to her waiting for my turn. And then he got to me and he said, you're a sweetheart. You're a peacemaker. And then he said, you're a little lamb. And I stood there thinking, I want to be a lion. (laughs) Well, do you know, I actually looked up some descriptions one time of lambs. And this is what it said. Lambs are considered dumb, vulnerable, have no sense of direction. That part might be true about me. They're timid, defenseless, all sorts of negative traits. But I saw one really good trait of the lamb that said this. They recognize the shepherd's voice. It said this is where stupidity ends for the lamb. They have a remarkable instinct for knowing the voice of their shepherd. And then I love this. It said what they lack in direction, they make up for in voice recognition for the shepherd. I thought, yes, that's my superpower, hearing God's voice and following the leading of the Holy Spirit. But seriously, God is the one who said, my sheep know my voice. See, God wants you to know his plan, his next steps for your life, but you'll never know it if you never listen. And if you never journal, you'll never remember it. Now remember, everything God says may not sound super spiritual. I told you my first directive I heard was clean up and clean out. And I could have disregarded that as being ridiculous. It can't be God. Surely he wouldn't ask me to do something so petty. And I could have never done a thing about it. But see, I had no idea at the time that getting cleaned up and getting organized is a link to success. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. Well, even though I didn't know those success principles like I do now, I took it literally mainly because that's all I heard. And you've heard me tell the stories, but I started getting my kitchen cleaned up and cleaned out. And suddenly peace in my surroundings led to peace in my mind. Nine months after that simple, practical word from God, got my whole house in order. I was promoted as the CEO of my dad's organization. My life grew, my salary grew, my opportunities, my exposure and influence, everything grew. But that one simple directive from setting aside time to hear from God, a specific word to me, it even led to writing a whole book about decluttering. It led to having it in the Vision 101 program. And now thousands of others are doing the same thing. And that's just one instance of scheduling time to hear from God and taking it seriously. So practice hearing God's voice. Always take a journal, take a pen, into your prayer time and write down whatever you hear. In fact, Jeremiah 30 verse two says, write all the words I've spoken to you in a book. See, when you approach life doing things God's way, you'll get God's results. And whatever you hear leads me to key number two, obey God. Number two, obey God. You know, I remember hearing a minister say that God will never advance his instructions for your life beyond your last act of disobedience. Think about that. You know, you could be saying, God, what do you want me to do? Please tell me. And he's saying, go back to the last thing I told you to do and check to see if you did it. And if you didn't, God will bring you back to it and back to it and back to it until what? You do it. You obey. You know, I remember reading um, the five love languages. When Roddy and I were going through a tough time and we were seeing a counselor, he told us to read that book. And you know, the five love languages are physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, gifts, and quality time. Well, Rodney said his aren't just physical touch and quality time. He wants quality touch. I was like, whatever. But anyway, (laughs) I found out God's love language is obedience. John 14 says, if you really love me, you will obey. So he interprets love by how well you obey what he tells you to do. You know, I recently read... um, Yang Yi Cho, who is the pastor of the world's largest church, he was asked what his secret to success was. You know what he said? I pray and I obey. 
Put that in the chat right now. That's a great thing to remember. I pray and I obey. But the thing is, it's a heart issue. When God tells you to give something or to do something, that's between you and God. This is not a Facebook moment. He's watching to see if you're going to do the right thing. Which, I want to tell you this story real quick. True story, I just love this. And it was about a soldier in World War II. It was this young guy in Florida. He was in a library one day during the war. And he picked up a book and he noticed that there were these like little margins in the side of the book. And handwritten and very heartfelt, you know. He looked in the front of the book and noticed the name of the previous owner and her address. Well, it was a lady named Holly who lived in New York City. So he wrote her a letter introducing himself and how he was about to be shipped off overseas to Europe the next day. And then he invited her to respond so they could talk about the book. Well, he was so surprised when he got a letter from her. So for 13 months, they wrote each other back and forth, just getting closer and closer, falling in love, but they'd never seen each other. In fact, he asked her for a photo, but she wouldn't send one. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? This was the first catfish. That's where it took place <laughs> in World War II. Now, one and a half years later, he's coming back home through New York City. And this was their big opportunity to meet for the first time and go to dinner. And she said, she said, I'll be waiting for you when you get off the ship. And she said, you'll know it's me by the pink flower in my hair. Well, he was so excited and nervous. The moment arrived, he stepped off the ship. And this beautiful woman came walking towards him. She took his breath away. Stunning, tall, beautiful figure, gorgeous features, looked like a movie star. He was so captivated by her beauty, he didn't even realize she wasn't wearing the pink flower. And she passed him by. He finally came back down to earth, and this lady in her 40s approached. Not very attractive, gray in hair, just so happened she was wearing the pink flower. Disappointed, but not showing it. He walked right up to her with a big smile. He saluted her. He said, hello, ma'am. He said, you must be Holly. I'm so glad to meet you. He said, can I take you to dinner? And the lady said to him, son, I'm not sure what's going on, but the young lady that just passed you asked me to wear this pink rose. And she said, if you invited me to dinner, then to tell you she'll be waiting for you in the restaurant across the street. It was a test. <laughs> Will you do the right thing when it's hard, when you don't understand it or don't even like it? I'm telling you, God will not only give you the desires of your heart, but even more when you obey. See, God is more interested in our hearts. And when he sees us do the right thing, get ready. God is about to impact your destiny. But if you don't fully obey what God's telling you to do, you will never move beyond your current circumstances. You know, I heard Joyce Meyer say, the Bible has two messages, just two, told in thousands of different ways, and this is it. Do what I tell you to do and you'll be blessed. Don't do what I tell you to do, you'll live under a curse. Two messages. I mean, think about Jonah. Remember God told him to go to Nineveh? Well, Jonah went the complete opposite direction to a town called Tarshish, which is funny to say, but he ended up getting swallowed up by a whole mess of problems, almost died, and then the well spit him out, and what did God say? Jonah, go to Nineveh. <laughs> I mean, notice, his instructions never changed. Well, just like the prophet told that little widow woman, you know, to give him the last meal, she could have given him half, so she could still have some, but here's the thing. Partial obedience is still disobedience. You know, my dad used to say when I was a little girl, he'd say, obey quickly and quietly. Why? Because delayed obedience is still disobedience. So what is it that God may have told you to do, but you didn't do it because it was too hard, and here it is a year later, and you're still struggling? I wanna encourage you today to take bold steps of obedience. Don't talk yourself out of God's will because it doesn't make sense to your mind. You know, anyone can obey God when it's easy and it's logical, but that doesn't take faith. But I'm telling you, doors of opportunity, favor, blessings are going to open up for you because of obedience. Okay, this leads me to my final key, the third key, willingness to give your best. You know, when God told me at the lowest time in my life to clean up and clean out, and I did it room by room, there was also one important thing I did during that season to change my life. 
I knew I had to get seed in the ground. I needed to give something. Now, how did I know this? Because as a young girl, I literally watched my parents give themselves out of poverty. Anytime my parents had a need, their first response was, we got to sow a seed. And they would give their best. So I went through my closets and I loaded up trash bags of some of my favorite best clothing to give to some of my friends. Now notice, the little lady in the Bible gave the prophet her absolute best. She gave God everything. Well, you've got to be willing to give like God. What did he give? His best, Jesus. He gave the absolute best he could possibly give. See, God can't release what's in his hand until you release what's in yours. Think about it like this. You know, I have some corn right here. What if I told a farmer who's praying for corn and I just said, no, hold on to it because I don't want you to have nothing. Just hold on to it. No, if he has one kernel left, the best thing he can do is sow it, get it in the ground. And that requires sacrifice. Well, you know, recently in prayer, the Lord said this to me, when he asked me to give something big and out of the ordinary, I wrote it all down. He said, your sacrifices are bringing the victory you asked for. He said, never feel sorry for yourself. You're going somewhere, most will never go, and you'll enjoy the fruit most will never taste. And then he said this, sacrifice now, celebrate later. I love that. And you know, that gave me so much peace because when you sacrifice, it's hard. We don't like it. It's not what we typically do, but we know that it's a setup for a breakthrough. So giving takes you from being reactive to being proactive. You know, I've heard people say that the key to getting what you want is help someone else get what they want. You've heard that phrase, what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. Well, I'm saying so before you grow. I heard Michael Todd say it like this. He said, when you hit a plateau, so. You might want to put that in the chat right now. When you hit a plateau, so. See, God said the whole earth revolves around the principle of seed time and harvest. Sowing and reaping will never pass away, but you can't have a harvest if you don't sow a seed. So I just want to quickly recap for you what I do when I have a dream and how I apply these three keys. And I've been doing this since 2002 and watched God increase my life year after year after year. So first, I listen for a specific word from the Lord. Remember in my first session, I told you how the Lord told me to be proactive. And I looked up the word, I researched it. And that word means to look, expect, act, prepare for what you ask God for. Why? Because God favors the prepared. When opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. Well, after I get a word from the Lord, I obey. How? Well, remember the definitions for look, expect, act, prepare? When God says to look, it means your vision, write your vision. Brian Tracy hammered that into our minds today. It's not a vision if it's in your head. You must write it down. So for me this year, I took it a step further and I enlarged some prints of you know, just vision, like for the offices and different goals that I have. And remember, we've talked about how your mind is like a magnet. God's word says, whatever a man thinks in his heart, so shall he become, right? What you think about, you bring about. So you have to look at the vision. Well, that word expect, how do you show God that you truly expect what you're believing God for? by thanking him before it ever happens. You get up every morning thanking God for what he's go going to do behind the scenes in your life. Well, act. How do you take action? God said faith without action is dead. Well, the action I recommend is build your faith by hearing God's word. That's what you're doing today. Feed your faith and starve your fears. Prepare. Are you preparing for what you ask God for? You know, recently the Lord said to me in prayer what the most proactive step I could ever take is. He said, get your seed in the ground today. And I wrote that down. I was like, I better do it now. He said, today. He said, sowing for your future is the most proactive thing you can do. Not one of, it's the single most important step to changing your present circumstances. And then the Lord said to me, you want to take a leap of faith? Don't keep your seed. Now this ties in with point number three about willing to give your best. 
Because what's interesting to me is that successful people understand the law of generosity. They may not see it as sowing and reaping or seed time and harvest, but they understand that generosity is a key to success. In fact, let me tell you a story real quick. I remember hearing a story about a guy who started the tempur mattresses and pillows. Now listen to this. He partnered with this guy in Sweden and they were supposed to sell 10,000 tempur mattresses. They sold 70. He was literally flat broke. He invested everything into this idea. He couldn't afford the next container, the shipment that was coming in, $75,000. He didn't know what he was gonna do. He borrowed money from his mom, his dad, his uncle, his friends. He didn't know how he was gonna make these mattresses sell. So he hit a plateau, right? And you know what he decided to do? So, when you hit a plateau, so. He decided one day to make a pillow and give tempur pillows to 500 chiropractors. He sewed big time when he needed it the most. Well, the chiropractors were so impressed, 25% of them responded buying more pillows. He ended up making $300,000 in four months. And then not long after that, they were the hottest product sold in Brookstone across America. When you hit a plateau, so, I'm telling you, God never forgets seed sown. It's willingness to give your best. You know, think about Galatians 6, 9. It says a man's harvest in life depends entirely upon the seeds he sows. Well, back to my story. You may know that we've been believing for seven and a half years to own our own offices. But we were told, no, you know, the building you're in is not for sale but you can lease some more space. Plus, you know, we were told there's no other offices for sale in your area. Then they came back to us right when we were about to lease more space and pay them a ton more rent. They said, we changed our mind. You can't lease any more space. We wanna give it to a restaurant. What do you do when it looks like everything you're praying for isn't happening? Well, I kept hearing my parents in my head saying, if you have a need, so is he. I kept hearing Jesse Duplantis when he gave advice to a man who said, how do I get my finances to grow? He said, increase your giving. I kept hearing Michael Todd say, if you've hit a plateau, so. Well, I did exactly what I'm sharing with you today. The three most important things in your life. Number one, a specific word from God. I broke this down. The Lord said, be proactive. Number two, obey God. Take a leap of faith. Number three, willingness to give your best. Do you see that? S-O-W, <laughs> I love a good acronym. But do you know our scripture for this year is Hebrews 11.1. One. And I printed this out because I want you to see it for yourself. I like to have just one verse that I attach my faith to all year long. Well, this verse says, now faith is the substance of things you hope for, the evidence of things not seen. My grandma Creech, my 92 year old grandma, reminded me to never skip over the word now in that verse, that God is working right now to bring you the dream in your heart. So I told my team, I said, now we need to get our best seed in the ground so God can work. So we sowed our best seed for our offices. Now we decided to actually sow 11.1 based on Hebrews 11.1, whether it's 111, 1,110, 11,100, that's our point of contact that now our faith is producing the dream we see in our hearts. Now, let me just say, there's nothing spiritual or magical about that number. It's just a verse that we're declaring all year long. So we sowed our best, 11,100 into several ministries who have amazing buildings and offices because you gotta sow where you wanna go, right? I want you to know, God is accelerating things. Things that should take five years, God is doing them in one year. Our scripture says, now faith is. Not tomorrow, not next year, now. When God says something, he means it. Do you think it's a coincidence that in the year of God telling us to take a leap of faith, to get ready, to sow Hebrews 11.1 1 as our theme scripture, now faith is working. After seven and a half years of believing, and we almost signed papers to lease more space. Some real estate guys out of nowhere presented us with an office building that just came on the market 
it's not 10,000 square feet. It's 22,000 square feet. It's more than double the size of our current building. It's five minutes from where we are. And it's not just on any piece of land. It's on the most gorgeous lake. Can you see this? And it's not for lease, it's for sale. In an instant, God took us from renters to owners. Can you just shout in the chat, thank you Jesus with me? We just closed on our brand new office building in the year God said, you will be amazed at what I do for someone who's ready. If you ask me for it, prepare for it. We were ready. My question for you today, are you ready? Are you preparing for what you ask God for? Preparing for your dream requires a specific word from God, obedience, and willing to give your best. You know, people look at my life today and they'll say, how did she get there? I'm not the most dynamic preacher. I'm not the most talented or charismatic. But you know what you haven't seen? The seeds I've sown. I am a serial giver. I told you when I needed clothes, I went through my closet and gave bags and bags full of clothes. I still do that. I have literally given truckloads of clothes through the years to safe houses and girls' homes, to friends and family constantly sewing clothing. Today, I have so many outfits. You know, last week someone sent me two pairs of stilettos. Another friend bought me my first pair of Louis Vuitton high heels. <laughs> I've been given purses, dresses. Last month, a box was at my front door and it was clothing from a very famous celebrity. She wore it. Is that coincidental? No, when you reach a plateau, so, I've sewn into other women who have best-selling books. I've posted photos holding their books, promoting it for everyone to buy. And you know, God recently brought me the best book agent, one of the best in America, to work with me on my next book. See, sowing seed isn't always money. You can sow your platform, your influence. God never forgets a seed sown. I have sown into so many pastors and ministers who have amazing buildings. I remember when we saved up $10,000 in the beginning of our ministry, and that took a lot to save up 10,000. And I sewed it into Joel Osteen's ministry because he got the compact center at a fraction of the price. What was I doing? So where you wanna go. I said, Lord, I'm sewing this for our building. I've sewn into so many others for office buildings. So where you wanna go. When you reach a plateau, sew. When you're experiencing your greatest needs, sow your greatest seeds. So should I be shocked that God brought us this opportunity this year to buy our first building twice as big as the one we're in and it's on the lake? It's more than I could ask or think. You know, I heard my dad say that when you sow seed, the seed leaves your hand, but it never leaves your life. God wants to do something so big in your life that can only be activated by giving. And in order for God to do what he wants to do in your life, it requires generosity. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. I heard Michael Todd say, as far as your dreams, you're never gonna see it until you sow it. And whatever area of your life has hit a plateau, sow. Your marriage, your career, your body, your health, your finances, you will break it by sowing. In fact, Michael Toddy continued that statement. He said he argued with God about this, saying, God, this doesn't make sense. And God said, but it makes miracles. So I want to give you an opportunity today to be proactive, to sow your Hebrews 11 one seed, whatever you're believing for, whichever area of your life has hit a plateau. So ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what you should give. You know, maybe you feel like it's Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of what you're hoping for, the evidence of things you don't see yet. That's our scripture this year. Then attach your faith to it. So Hebrews 11, 1, like we're doing. Could be $111, and that's a huge step of faith if that's your best. It could be 1,110 if that's your absolute best. Like the little widow woman, she gave Elijah. Maybe it's more. Maybe it's 11,100. I just know that whenever we know in our hearts we're supposed to give, and sometimes you'll think, no, that's the devil. Satan will never tell you to give anything. In fact, if there's one thing he wants to stop, it's your seed getting in the ground. God says, step out in faith and obey. 
So I just want to give you an opportunity right now while the anointing is on this message and we close out this conference strong, I'm just going to obey what God put in my heart to tell you. Sow your Hebrews 11, one seed for your now faith is dream in your heart. Does that make sense? In fact, I want you to just close your eyes and think about it. Don't rush through this. Don't just give what you always give. Give your best, whatever that means to you. You know, you may have thought $111 for Hebrews 11.1, but it's not your best. Maybe your best is to double it. I don't know. I just know what God dealt with me about. So I'm going to pray over your seed right now, and I'm going to join my faith with yours that you are breaking free from the setbacks that have stopped you in the past. You are sensitive to God's voice. You're obedient, and you will receive every dream God has put in your heart. This is your year to take a leap of faith, be proactive, and be ready for your breakthrough. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for every precious person who's watching this. Lord, I believe you're speaking to them right now that this is the time to get a specific word from you, to obey, and to be willing to give. And, Father, I believe in Jesus' name what you told me, it applies to everyone watching. The moment the seed leaves your hand, you release what's in yours. And Father, we go ahead and say thank you, Jesus, for the harvest. So, if you feel like God is leading you to give your Hebrews 11 one offering or whatever he's speaking to your heart, all you have to do is click the Give button on the screen or you can text TSFM to 28950. And hey, I want to encourage you to declare Hebrews 11 one every single day and get ready. The moment the seed leaves your hand, I believe God releases what's in his. Just start praising him and thanking him for your dreams now in Jesus' name. Make plans now to supercharge your growth during the Live Your Dreams virtual event with Terry Savelle Foy along with special guests, Bob Goff, April Osteen Simons, Gary Cassie, Nicole Crank, Real Talk Kim, and more. It's all happening April 28th, and you don't want to miss it. So if you're ready to build your faith and get practical steps to achieve your dreams and goals, hurry over to terry.com to register for this virtual conference for free today.